Welcome back. Today I'm going to share with you some work that I've done with Daniel Delewski and Nathan Coots, which we published in Physical Review E under the title Sparse Identification of Slow Timescale Dynamics. The focus for today is going to be on multi-scale signals. And in particular, we're going to look at signals for which, on a short time scale, these signals appear to be periodic. And periodic is a good thing because it's repetitive, it's predictable. So we can forecast these solutions or these signals far into the future. But the types of signals we'll be interested in are not completely periodic. In fact, when you start looking at them in a longer time scale, a slow drift starts to emerge. And this slow drift can actually be very complex behavior when you look at the signal on an extremely long time scale. In fact, it could even be the case that the slow drift is actually a chaotic slow motion evolving in the background. Now, these types of signals abound in nature. One place that we find them continuously are in tidal dynamics. So what you can see here is data gathered outside of Seattle by Parker McCreary's lab here at the University of Washington. And what we can see on a short time scale, a one day time scale, is what we know about tides already. They evolve on a periodic oscillation in which you have two low tides and two high tides per day. But as you can see from the data collected here, if you start looking over longer time scales, such as a month or even a year, you see that the motion is not completely periodic. You still get those daily highs and lows, but as we evolve for a very, very long time, there emerges a distinct slow pattern that looks extremely complex. Now, another place where we find this is in our solar system. And what we know from, say, elementary science class was that the planets, they orbit the sun in an almost perfectly elliptical motion. But simulations of our solar system over millions of years show that this elliptical orbit is not perfect. In fact, the planets exhibit a slight deviation, typically referred to as the eccentricity of the orbit. It's a wobble in that motion that emerges only after thousands of years. And we know that this wobble is induced by the gravitational interaction of all of these planets orbiting around the sun and coming into contact with each other. Now, from a mathematical perspective, we can analyze these types of multi-scale signals using the process of averaging. In particular, let's focus on the given ordinary differential equation up here. Epsilon is taken to be a small parameter which measures the disparity between the two distinct uh, timescales in our signal. And the periodicity of the fast scale oscillation is given by the periodicity of the non-autonomous component on the right-hand side of our ODE. Now, as the, the name averaging suggests, what we can do to analyze this system is literally average the right-hand side over one fast period of oscillation. The result is an autonomous ordinary differential equation which describes that slow drifting going on in the background. Now, there are analytical results that tell us that the, the multi-scale solution X and the average solution y stay very, very close for a very long time. And this cartoon at the bottom is really helping us to understand what's happening. The averaging process irons out those fast scale wiggles or oscillations and leaves us just with the background drifting motion. Now, we want to take a data-driven perspective on this averaging process and extracting these slow timescale dynamics. And this means that we don't have the governing equations, the ordinary differential equation that describes such a signal. The only thing that we are given is the signal itself. So the question is, how can we extract that slow scale motion? And the way that we'll approach this is by coarse graining the signal. What we're going to do is we are going to sample the signal after the completion of each fast period. And the goal here will be to look for or discover a mapping which iterates us along this coarse-grained signal. 
And if you can imagine for a moment that there is a slow average system governed by the dynamical system where the right hand side is denoted g here, well then we can use Taylor's theorem and some of the identities above in order to show that there is a direct correspondence between the coarse grain mapping f and the average dynamical system g. In particular, we can see that if we truncate at order epsilon and we rearrange, discovering f allows us to discover the average system g. Now, the first thing that needs to be done in order to apply this method is determine exactly what the fast scale period is. And to do this, we turn to some recent work by Deluski, Tau, and Kutz, in which they propose a method of sliding window dynamic mode decomposition. And the idea is that you subsample your signal over a small uh, window and apply dynamic mode decomposition to learn a linear model in this window. And then you advance by one time step and repeat that process, learn another linear model. And the goal here is to sweep over the entire signal all the while learning these dynamic mode models. And this will give you a different or close to different linear model at each window. And then what you can do is you can put together a statistical picture of the frequencies and eigenmodes that are present inside of each window. And if the window is chosen to be not too small, but also not too large, then what you can find typically is that the frequencies present in each window separate into two groups, one of which is bounded away from zero, representing that fast scale periodic motion. Whereas the second group is very, very close to zero here, representing the slow scale movement, which is approximately constant over a window. And once you have this statistical picture put together, you can use a clustering algorithm to determine what exactly the fast scale frequency should be. And with this fast scale frequency, you can begin coarse graining your mapping or your signal. And this will allow you to have a discrete sequence of points for which we want to use the Cindy method, which was referred to in a previous video, to find that nonlinear mapping that iterates you along these coarse grain elements of your signal. What I do want to emphasize now is that this method tells us exactly what our sparsity parameter should be. We don't have to search for it because we want our sparsity parameter to be on the order of the scale disparity parameter epsilon squared. And the reason for this is simple. It comes from the fact that if you go back to the Taylor expansion that we showed a few slides ago, we are simply truncating at the order epsilon terms in order to relate the, the mapping f to the slow dynamics g. So let me show you this in practice. This is an example coming from the paper in which we simulated uh, synthetic data to get uh, for a Sun, Jupiter, and Saturn three-body problem where we used accurate values for the mass and the initial conditions. What I'm showing you here is the projection of the results into their orbital planes. The white ball in the center is meant to represent the sun, whereas you can see the motion of Jupiter and Saturn around the sun. Now what you notice is that they trace down approximately circles around the sun. That's your fast periodic motion on the order of years. But the simulation is taken for millions of years into the future. And what we can see is that we don't trace down a perfect circle, but there is a slight wobble represented by the thickened lines here, which are the eccentricity of these orbits that comes from the interaction between Saturn and Jupiter. And so what we were able to do is apply these methods. And what, for example, for the Jupiter system, or for the Jupiter orbit, we can find that the slow average dynamics are given by a simple linear symplectic mapping as shown down here on the board. Now, what this really means is that on very, very long time scales, the motion of Jupiter lies on a torus. One fast period of oscillation around the sun and one slow wobbling as you're going around. 
And our work shows that you can do exactly the same thing for Saturn. Similarly, you arrive at a symplectic linear dynamical system that similarly describes the motion of Saturn on very, very long time scales. So let's conclude with a little bit of a discussion and an outlook. The question that might be on some of our minds is, why wouldn't we just try to learn the full multiscale signal? Well, we address this in the paper, and we show that with these multiscale type signals, the Cindy method, for example, becomes ill-posed. And the reason for this is because you have a rapidly oscillating fast scale, leading to a rapidly oscillating derivative as well, meaning that we have a very hard time discovering the emergent slow scale dynamics here. So by averaging out this fast scale, we can figure out and we can learn this emergent property from the slow scale dynamics. Now something that we would really like to address moving forward is moving down successive levels of slow scale evolution. So for example, with the Saturn and Jupiter orbits, we know that there's an even slower emergent scale. And we would like to be able to average the slow scale to go down another level. And finally, we would like to know if we can extend these ideas to spatiotemporal systems. So we'd like to know if we could maybe average over space instead of time. Or we would like to be able to average over both space and time simultaneously arriving at these slow scale drifts in both space and time around coherent structures that might be emerging on long time scales in spatiotemporal systems.